I'm really excited about this next talk uh, because it turns out that the app uh, that Ben works on today is actually an app that I helped create at Netflix. And so I haven't actually been able to talk about it that much personally in the public. Um, but this is kind of exciting for me because this is kind of like an unveiling of, you know, my one-year-old baby in a way, although I was only ever at Netflix for a few months. Uh, and so uh, Ben's here to talk about Ember at Netflix, and let's give him a, round, a big round of applause. And uh, without further ado, here's Ben Lesh. All right. Um, hello. Hello. Can people hear me? Is this on? Okay, good. All right. Uh, Ember at Netflix. That's, uh, uh, Eric asked me to come and talk about Ember at Netflix because a uh, few of you, well, first of all, <laughs> introductions. My name is Ben Lesh. I am a senior UI engineer on the Edge Tools and Insights team at Netflix. Um, this is my uh, contact information, Twitter handle. You can email me. Uh, if you have any questions about my talk or you just want to talk tech or whatever, by all means, uh, follow me, send me messages. I, I love that stuff. So. All right, so a few of you might have heard that Netflix likes React, right? That's, that's a blog entry that, that they posted recently. Um, and if you actually research Netflix UI engineers online, you'll see that there's a, a Twitter account, Netflix UIE, and they, they uh, cite React there. Um, there's, there's something that, that uh, people don't often realize, because whenever I say I work on an Ember app at Netflix, people are, well, I thought they were React. Um, React is used for the customer-facing UI. So Re React is a great framework, um, uh, but that, this is primarily used by the, the team that, that writes all the customer-facing UIs. There's actually a lot of JavaScript at Netflix. So we have, you name it, uh, Angular, Ember, Backbone, React, Knockout, and so on and so forth, all the, everything you see listed here and more uh, at Netflix for a, a wide variety of internal applications. So at, Netflix is not a React shop, we're not an Ember shop, we're not an Angular shop, we're not specifically any kind of shop. Uh, we have this thing at Netflix called freedom of responsibility. And uh, what that means is that developers and teams are, uh, are free to choose their own tools. So uh, at Netflix, we chose this tool. This <laughs> is... Uh, <laughs> This is, uh, this is Mr. Eric Brin wearing an Angular t-shirt in front of a picture of George Bush. I believe that's hung over a toilet. Uh, but it's a, it's a real thing. And, and we got started on an Ember app after we chose our tool. I'm sorry, Eric. I, I live to, to tarnish your rep, man. So in, in fact, uh, recently I've learned uh, that Netflix likes Ember a lot. Uh, we had a a uh, meeting recently amongst all the other Ember developers at Netflix, and I didn't think that would, there would be a lot. There was an entire uh, meeting room, a large meeting room at Netflix full of, of Ember developers from different teams. So here's a few of the, the Ember uh, apps. First, first of all, where are my Netflix people at here? I thought there would be a few more here, but those, those are all fellows that I work with. <laughs> Thanks, Netflix, for showing up. Um, <laughs> So th this here is what's called Mantis UI. This is a management tool for the distributed stream processing uh, engine that my tool actually uses. Uh, it's got a lot of fun real-time things where you can see all of the cores that are being used on various instances to run all the jobs that we need to get all the real-time streaming data for my app. Uh, here's another screenshot of it showing like a graph, I think, of memory usage on one of the instances. Another Ember app, uh, also written by Chris Carey, who's in here, um, over there, is uh, Netflix RDX. So what this gets used for is it's real-time anomaly detection for uh, different titles and devices that are deployed. So whenever they you know, put out Kimmy Schmidt, uh, for example, this is a place where they'd go to look and make sure there weren't a lot of errors all of a sudden on a newly encoded title like that. And it's... Um, it's got a lot of really nice data visualizations to it. Uh, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty cool Ember app. Uh, Chris, Chris writes good stuff. So another one. This is actually exciting. So this, this tool here, uh, Fit, you could actually use to take out Netflix for the entire world if you wanted to. This is, this is a, fa a failure testing app 
You could get into an Ember app and literally destroy Netflix for millions of users if you wanted. The reason this is cool is the, the gentleman that developed this, Colton Andrus, uh, sat on the other side of the cube wall for me while, while Eric was working with us. And he actually is a back-end engineer. So this, this is not someone who would ever claim, I don't think, to, to be a full-stack engineer, didn't have a lot of web development experience, was able to, able to take uh, Ember CLI and, did this just blank out on me? Hello? Technical difficulties. Wah, wah. Am I back? Yes. This has electrical tape on it up here. I don't trust it. Um, all right, so he, he was able to take Ember CLI and create an Ember app from scratch with zero web development experience. And it, it's, a, it's a pretty nice app. I mean, honestly, you're for, for a beginner's effort, uh, and they, he uses it every day to do failure testing, uh, failure, failure injection testing uh, at Netflix. Uh, other, other teams around Netflix. So this here, ATS, this is an app that's used uh, for talent management for recruiters. So if you've ever applied for a job or had a recruiter contact you at Netflix, you're probably in the system. I cannot wait to get back to Netflix and look up my information to see what they've said about me. Although if they see this, they're probably going to block me out of it. Uh, another one is Memento. This is a supplier management tools app. This is just uh, to manage all the various suppliers that supply Netflix with all sorts of equipment and things uh, worldwide. This one's pretty cool. This one's called Van Dam. Van Dam is, everything in Netflix has like a movie name, so bear, bear with me on some of that, except for our tool. Our tool is like a Greek god or something. Um, Van Dam is a media asset management tool. They use this to share uh, different bits of uh, things like movie bits, sound bites, uh, advertising, um, rigmarole that with, with various adver advertising agencies and aspects of Netflix around uh, the Netflix ecosystem, so internationally. It's, it's really neat. There's some neat stuff in there. Is this blinking out again? Maybe. It's blinking out on these screens. That's why I keep asking. Um, all right, so then there's a lot more that I know of. Uh, there's an Ember Act for tra uh, tracking content licensing. I w really, really wanted to figure out where this was and get a screenshot of it. Content licensing at Netflix is the number one expenditure of Netflix. So. They're trusting something like that to an Ember app. I mean, this is, they, they spend a lot. I don't even know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, acquiring content uh, for uh, play worldwide. Uh, another one is an Ember app for tracking financials around Open Connect deployments. So when you, whenever they send hardware to various ISPs to uh, improve your Netflix experience, there's an Ember app that tracks uh, the, the expenses around that. Uh, an Ember-based Chrome extension that is used by recruiters for collecting metadata around uh, candidates when they're doing research. Um, and there's a lot of other uh, UI uh, visualization things. Actually, Elijah Meeks sent me one. I'll have to show it to anybody who asks later. There's some really, really cool flowchart diagrams and A-B testing diagrams that get done uh, with Ember and D3. So what about my app? Well, the, the app that I work on is called Argus, and Argus is a real-time dashboard that has a lot of interactive uh, visualizations of what's happening in the Netflix cloud. So uh, here's a quick video of it. You'll notice it's very blurry. This is blurry because this is real production data that is, has to be redacted because I can't just run around telling everybody how many play starts we have or anything like that. But this is all ticking in real-time over, oh, about 12 different data streams that are flowing over a single web socket. Um, it's, it does a lot. The reason I wanted to show a video of this is because whatever framework we choose to develop something like this has to be performant. Uh, these tables go on and on forever. There are components and graphs inside of some of the tables. Um, and they need to update very quickly because you'll, you'll notice the, the graphs that actually occur on the right-hand side, once they start getting data from Mantis, tick in roughly every 10, 20 seconds or so and update. So this, this is another view. This is actually showing more of a, an, a high level view of Netflix infrastructure where um, requests are flowing to and from. And then uh, I, I think this actually goes a little bit next into the uh, customer detail view, which will actually get used by customer support. So if you call in and you're having a lot of problems, they can go in and uh, actually look up myself here. Uh, my son watches a lot of uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. So I think it, it shows that there. You can't quite read it. 
But uh, they can go in and they can see what's happening with your account. They can actually look at uh, how, your, how your video is streaming, like what, what's your bit rate and, and things like that, and, and help you uh, debug problems. So key ways that uh, Ember has, have, has really benefited us uh, on the Argus team. Uh, routing is first class. So this is really important. If I'm an engineer and I see a problem with a particular graph or uh, with, with a, a particular service that I'm, that I'm looking at in Argus, I need to be able to send a link easily over HipChat or whatever to another engineer and say, hey, check this out. Uh, so the fact that I can have everything routed and stateful via the URL with Ember is, is really helpful. Uh, the components are easy to develop. I'm going to focus on this a lot. Uh, all of those graphs you see there, uh, it was very, very important to be able to componentize those in such a way that uh, it made uh, Jeff, in particular's work, easier. Jeff, Jeff did the mass majority of, of the feature development on Argus. Um, so that's, that's very important. Uh, the other thing that's really nice about Ember uh, is the nice, clear, and easy upgrade path. So we haven't had too many problems upgrading from, I think, 1.6 is what it was on when we started. Uh, to we're on 110 now. I have no worries about going to 111 now that it's released. Uh, but yeah, that's that's been really really good for us, and it's not always great with with some frameworks. So the, it has clear opinions about um, the the app structure. So when Jeff and I are working together, or Jeff and I and Chris, if he was to jump in, or any other developer was to jump into the code, they would know exactly where all the files are. And this is a big app, so you can't just have well, let's name our own uh, file structure for our application today. That would, that would get hairy very fast. So the opinions are, impor are important. The other thing that's nice is it integrates well with D3 and RxJS, which we use heavily in this, in this application. So the, the graph, or the components, uh, the, the reason this was so great is it allowed me to create uh, some composable graph components for Jeff to use to create all the features that you saw. Uh, this is an example of what it kind of looks like. You'll see there's a graph component, some graph content with a line and a vertical line. I'm going to try to do a live coding uh, demo of this afterwards, but templatable uh, axes and that sort of thing. So I was able to create a DSL. It's line graphs, bar graphs, area graphs, stacked area graphs, brush selection. All of the things you saw happening there are, are done very expressively uh, in our handlebars templates. Just another quick video of you know, kind of what I mean here. So in this particular view, you'll see four different graph components, four different graph contents, about a dozen line components that are added in there, several vertical line components uh, on each one that activate when you mouse over and it emits hover data. So all of this was uh, no, no real code for, for Jeff or myself or whoever Im implements this. It was just a matter of plugging our array of data into our line components and, and setting up proper uh, domains, which are the min and max values on either axes. So the, the, another, the way that, this, that Ember is a little bit better for this is I came from an Angular background. In fact, that was why I was hired at Netflix, was for my Angular expertise. Angular has a thing called directives. Uh, and I, I know I'm playing to an Ember audience here, but directives are difficult to develop uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, creating parent-child communication. They have mechanisms for this, uh, but you kind of need to be an expert uh, in, in Angular in order to develop these things. Ember, on the other hand, uh, had they, the components are all structured the same way you would structure anything else in Ember, a route or a controller. So it made it very, very easy to pick up and work on. And there's also mechanisms like nearest with property that allow you to find a parent component and maybe call a method on it to register your child component or that sort of thing. So really, it's, it's, it's been great for that. The other thing is it supports SVG out of the box. The reason there's an asterisk is that means now. When we first started, there was a little bit, uh, there were just a few things that didn't work quite right with, with SVG, but I'm happy to say that uh, Ember has zero is issues with uh, SVG now. So the final thing is it was easy to separate into an add-on so I could share with Chris Carey or other uh, teams around Netflix. And now I've actually open sourced it so I can share it with the entire world. Um, Ember CLI, NF Graph. Now I've already gotten crap about the name a couple times. Like people want to change it to Ember NF Graph. Maybe that'll happen. I, I'm sure they'll strong arm me into it. Uh, but 
It's available uh, now. Uh, you, can, you can find it on GitHub. There's documentation. Uh, you just install it the way you'd install any other add-on with uh, Ember CLI. So Netflix likes Ember too. Uh, I think I showed you a lot of Ember apps. I was actually shocked when I learned how, how many there were. Uh, but mostly Netflix likes freedom of responsibility. The reason there's so many Netflix or there's so many Ember apps at Netflix is because teams were allowed to choose whatever technology they thought best fit their 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 needs. So uh, that's why the you the UI team has chosen React. That's why our team chose Ember. Um, so it's 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 a big deal. The the freedom of responsibility thing is probably the best part of working at Netflix. So. There's the uh, jobs link. They have uh, some slide decks there about the freedom of responsibility at, at uh, Netflix and Netflix culture. I, I recommend watching. So questions, comments? Yeah. Freedom and responsibility of responsibility. If you guys have questions, come up to this microphone here at the bench so we can get them on video. Hi. So with these tools, uh, oh, I'm Andrew Ponger. I'm at uh, LinkedIn uh, Web Dev. Um, I'm curious about the ownership of these tools. So you have a team come together. There's a need for a tool. You decide on the tech, and you build it. What happens with it after that? Who owns it if people leave? In so like uh, specifically like the NF graph or that, like the, the tool, components the I was talking about, or just in general? like Just in general. Like the Argus tool, for example. Yeah. Uh, generally, like Argus, like we have a team dedicated specifically to developing that particular tool mm -hmm. because it's very important strategically to Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, the other tools, like say that Fit tool, that was developed by the author of all the failure injection testing work, or at least the majority of the failure inj injection testing work done at Netflix. So I would assume if he has a, a uh, someone that comes after him, a successor, that, that that person would probably take that over. So generally, all of these apps are developed by teams that are dedicated to maintaining those, those apps. Does, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah definitely. Thanks. Cool. So, so Ben, uh, out of curiosity, I mean, I think choosing Ember for these tools was part of that story, right? Was the maintainability, the future maintainability of these things was a big reason why you, you guys built Argus in Ember, right? Right, right. I, I think it probably didn't hurt that we had contracted you, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, that's, that is, that is a, a big... I mean, I, I remember when basically the sales pitch was, you will be able to hire an Ember developer, and they will be able to sit down in your application and know what they're doing because of the conventional structure, right? right? That, that's right, that's right. So, I mean, it, absolutely, if, if, uh, if our team had said... Even, even with you there, I, I thoroughly believe this. If our team was like, no, no, Ember is not the right tool for us, uh, we would not be using Ember. But it was definitely the right tool for us for uh, some of the reasons you stated and a variety of others that I've talked about. Hi, Ben. Hi, uh, Jay. I'm, I'm Jay Phelps. I'm actually a new hire as of uh, January at Netflix. And I just wanted to, to actually, literally, I'm a, uh, a perfect example of, of uh, uh, Ember's convention over configuration ability to jump into an application. I jumped into their application Argus and literally created and shipped a feature within the first couple days of starting at Netflix. I have never been able to do that at any company ever, regardless of the framework tooling that they set up. Jumping into their app, which is a massive, massive Ember app, was really, 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 really easy. So just wanted to share that. It, everything he said is true. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> So are there any other questions? Uh, oh, go ahead. Yep. Hey, uh, uh, my name's Liam. Um, we, so you mentioned, um, so you got this long list of items, and you said it was working great performance-wise. Um, but I think that's also one of the kind of trolls in Ember right now is that performance for long lists of items that update. And also, isn't right. that one of the reasons for, for Glimmer? Like, did you all do anything special to get the good performance we, on that stuff? Yeah, we, we, did hit, we did hit some of, some of the performance issues uh, around... In particular, it was around eaching over lists of components. We, we, had, uh, we had some performance issues there. Uh, now with 110, some of those issues have been alleviated. Um, but yeah, we, we, did, we did actually hit some of those. The, the thing that we discovered was that Ember does perform a lot better if you don't use a lot of components or views inside of your each. So originally, I had a, a, a table component 
that was doing some really fancy stuff with templates, uh, kind of using some some backdoors and some some private APIs to to get some things done. And it was creating an awful lot of views, child views under an each, and that was unperformant for us. But when we used Net or when we used uh, Ember in the prescribed way, we we didn't really have any performance issues. So it was a good question. You should also mention uh, the array computed property thing. That was a troll for you, returning a different array from every computer property. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that w one, another issue that we, that we did have was uh, with tables, because I was, I was new to Ember, and I was just like, yeah, I'm going I'm to map reduce things in my computed properties. I was creating new arrays all the time, and so every single time my eaches would re-render re everything. So it was, it was important to make sure I was always using the same array. Uh, in my each that was being rendered, so it didn't uh, try to recreate everything every time. That was a that was an issue that we had run into, but that was my fault. And so this is actually fixed in Glimmer. It won't that won't troll people anymore. So I'm happy about yeah. that. So uh, my name is Jiping, and uh, I know that in some business applications, uh, different users have uh, different permissions, and so on the menu you suppose different URLs. Um, one way I can think of to handle this uh, is dynamically register routes. Um, I just wonder, is that possible with Ember? Dynamically registering routes? I don't actually know. Maybe Eric could answer that question. We're, we're not doing anything like that. Yeah, right so there's some known tricks, uh, some 10 known tricks on how you can dynamically register routes with Ember. Uh, that's my BuzzFeed headline. Uh, so basically, the easiest way to do this is with a catch-all route. Um, so you can use the glob URLs. Basically, you can have a glob param. You can have a catch-all route. And then you can actually dynamically load using your model hook or your before model hook or whatever in that catch-all route. You can actually load code. And that's actually how people are doing lazy loading of different parts of their application today. Um, I don't know if anybody's given a talk on that. I know our friends at Practice Fusion up in the city are doing this, so maybe I'll rope one of them into giving a talk on this. But it's definitely possible. If you tweet at me, I'll link you. Uh, hope, well, I'll write up a gist or something for you. Yep. Any other questions for Ben? No? All, All right. right. All right. So does people, want, anyone want to see me uh, muck up a live coding adventure of yes. showing off my components? Yes. Yay. <laughs> All right. People see that, I guess, sort of. So what, what I have here, what I've set up, for, because I, I'm always worried that NPM or the internet or the, the internet is an actual thing that can hurt you. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, will we'll bone me on uh, trying, to, trying to get a project going. So I, I've already set up. Uh, just Ember CLI new project and added my add-on with uh, Ember with uh, Ember install add-on um, Ember CLI NF Graph. Uh, I have some data that I'm getting. Uh, it's no real magic. It's not even really great code. It's just a couple of arrays of of x and y values uh, that I'm just writing out here, and that's it. I'm actually not really even going to go into a controller, uh, but this is to show the, 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 the DSL for, for doing some of this. So let's make sure that the, I'm up here. And I can, we'll do it live. <laughs> I still like that meme, I know it's old. <laughs> All right, so there's my data, isn't that great? Making sure it's actually doing something. Ta da yep, all right. Let's make a graph. So in order to make a graph, a very basic thing with NF graph is just to add NF graph, right? Nothing magical there. Another bit to this, and I'll get to why this is in a second, is that you need to add NF graph content. And this is the place that houses all of your lines or areas or bars. And then finally, let's add a line. So my data came from my data. Nice and simple. And hopefully I'll see a squiggly line. 
ta-da, that's it. Drop the mic, go home. Um, so this is, this is not terribly useful in this form. We do use uh, the, the graph like this as little spark lines in some of our tables, uh, which I don't know if you saw or not in the video. But we need to add some axes, otherwise this is, this is not the most useful thing. So to add an axis, yep. This, I'm, by the way, I'm not like a Vim god. You see, I'm like fumbling my way through uh, Sublime right now. But at least I've got this down. Bam. Um, <laughs> right, now, right now, there's a little bit of magic uh, with tick value. Uh, Mr. Eric Brin put in a block params issue on GitHub so you can name tick. But if I do that, I should get an x-axis. There you go. There's some ticks. That's actually templatable, so if I put like some other character there, like, I don't know, money. Look, look at that. So now we're, we're tracking money. This is, what's that? Oh. Better? Sort of. Okay, and we also need a y-axis, so copy pasta. Look at that. So there we go. This is, th this is the basics of it, but it, it gets better than that. So the height of this is a little wonky. Let's, I think, maybe make it, I don't even know what the height is because I've zoomed things in so much, but 200. You'll see that uh, my y-axis goes past zero. Wouldn't it be cool if I could just have a line at zero? Well, I can do that because this is a DSL that has a lot of features. So I can add a horizontal line at y0. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Boo -hoo. Boo -hoo. That's how cheap I am. I'm, I'm actually going to put some pasta in my pockets later on the way out. So <laughs> you'll see I added this, I added this line. It's, it's, uh, can you see that? Is that actually visible, kind of? Um, added a line. You can put it anywhere you want. Zero is probably a better place for it, but I could put it at 10 if I wanted. Uh, but it, it gets better. I can do other things. So I had other data, like um, let's, let's make an area. So an area is the same thing. My data, too. Ta-da, so fancy. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we need to do a lot of in our particular app is track the data. So know what data is at a particular spot. So what I can do here is add a tracking mode. And I'm going to do snap last. What snap last does is it's going to snap to the last piece of data. And here, whoop, no, not tracking dash mode. Who wrote this thing? It's going to go to the last piece of data. So, so now you'll see I have a little dot that follows me around as I'm uh, doing a mouse over here. It actually is snapping to the nearest data point, not just to where my mouse is at. So if I was to have only three or four data points, it would go to the, the nearest data point to my mouse. So the other thing I can do is I can actually get that data. because we need to do this fairly often, and actually write it out somewhere. So we'll put So let's figure out the, what the y value is that thing's at. So magical. And there, there's, there's other things you can do with this, too. So I could take this uh, horizontal line component, and I could add tracked y to that. So now it's following that. Uh, what about vertical? So you got little crosshairs that follow it around. 
The, one, of the, one of the nice things that Ember has enabled us to do with this as well that I'm not really able to do with uh, the W3C branded components yet or even Polymer, There's, there might be ways to do that in Polymer, but is this actually is just SVG. So if I wanted to add any piece of SVG I want, just custom SVG in here, I can totally do that. And you'll see there's my lovely circle there. So that, I mean, this is, this is really what it's all about. Uh, I can add brush selection really easily. Another, another thing we needed to be able to do. So now I'm able to do brush selection. Um, after that, I'd be wiring up actions to get like the brush end and that sort of thing. So all of these are things that we use on a daily basis to develop Argus. Uh, doing it this way, in my opinion, is a little bit faster and easier than trying to, to grok your way through D3 if you're not used to D3. Uh, it's very, very composable. I, I could move these around if I want the line to go behind the area. I mean, it's just a matter of order, right? Because composition. So now the, uh, I'm sorry, the line is in front of the area now. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 this, is, this is the tool in its entirety, and it's, it's free uh, and open for anyone to use and uh, you know, yell at me if, if something breaks. But we, this is battle-tested. We're, we're using this in Argus in production on a daily basis. So that's it. That's the Let's get a round of applause for that demo, right? <laughs> Who's ever used D3 here before? Raise your hand. Is it this easy? Hell no. Oh my god. Thank you so much to Ben for giving that awesome presentation. And thanks to all you wonderful people out there for coming. Um, do we have any questions? I guess you have a question? Come up to the mic real quick before Ben runs off with pasta in his pockets. <laughs> making room. I'm making room. Ben has three kids. They are hungry kids. They, he, like, they like pasta and, <laughs> and cookies. Um, um, Praveen, can you show the data model of that my, my data? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just I an already, array I, like, of data points, everything. right? I'm like, drop the mic, I'm out. <laughs> Thank you. So, all right. It was just an array of yeah, numbers, it was, right? It was, that, that was just an array of uh, numbers. So this is customizable. You don't have to scrub your array into X and uh, objects with X and Y values on it. You could actually select what you want to use for X and Y. But the route is pretty darn simple. All I'm doing is creating two arrays and pushing uh, objects with x and y values onto it, if that makes sense. So, so yeah, yeah it, just, just a set of points, just a set of points. But uh, we actually have larger data sets. So one of the things that Argus does is we'll have an array of arrays, right? We'll have an array with lots and lots of data points on, on each uh, item in the array. And we use those to feed multiple lines in a single graph. So uh, there, there are mechanisms, uh, x prop and y prop on both the, uh, the NF graph or NF bar or NF, NF uh, line components, I'm sorry, NF area components as well, that allow you to select which element in the array or which property on your array object you care about. And it can even select deeply. So, so property name, do you have to be X and Y or can be any No, that's what I'm saying. It, it could be anything. So if you have an array of things you, and it's consistent at each point in that array, you can select, uh, you know, foo, bar, baz, deep into it for your x property, and then maybe just y for your y property or whatever you care about. But it's, it's able to select into your array. So you don't have to scrub it if you don't want to. It'll scrub it for you. So by default, it just defaults to using points x and y. Yep. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks again, Ben. Let's give him another round of applause. I have a feeling the internets are going to love this presentation. So good news. These talks were recorded and we're going to be posting them as soon as we get the recordings from our lovely hosts at LinkedIn. Let's give a round of applause for LinkedIn. Thank you very much for hosting us. And uh, uh, I think the news is out. They're a new member of the Ember community. So thanks for being a new awesome member of the Ember community. So thank you again to all of you. Beautiful, wonderful people. Let's finish all the beer or, you know, drink all the soda, and uh, 
head home. So thanks, guys.